This documentary was produced for the Psychoactive Substances Research Collection at the Purdue University Libraries Archive. The collection was established in 2006 with a generous gift from the Bessie Gordon Foundation. This archive seeks to document the international history of psychoactive substances and their benefits to medicine and healing and to preserve the contribution of scientists in this area of research. There's a story that I tell people and they say, why have you studied psychedelics for so long and I sort of say well think of the things that can change your life you fall in love you get married you have children uh, maybe you get a divorce uh, a child dies a parent or sibling dies you take LSD and then I would sort of there's a pregnant pause and people think I take, and I say think about this LSD is an extremely potent substance you take a very tiny amount it diffuses into your brain, it stays there for three or four hours, it diffuses back out. And for some people, they never see the world the same way again. In 1965, Francis Vaughn participated in early research on psychedelics at the Foundation for Advanced Studies in Menlo Park. Well, my husband and I, signed up for it really out of, I think, a sense of adventure and exploration. We had read about uh, some of the psychedelic therapy and the accounts from Al Aldous Huxley and some of the early researchers. We were both curious and we wanted to try it. It seemed that uh, we were good candidates and we passed all the, all the screening tests. And so uh, um, I'm just grateful that 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 happened for us. Under carefully controlled conditions, she was given a high dose of LSD. Today, the effects of that journey are still present for her. What one is left with is the memory of the experience. And then one can talk about that, but it's impossible to convey what that experience is like in words. And it's not the same for everybody. For me, it was a deep mystical experience. and. Uh, it's as though the, the boundaries between self and other were completely dissolved. You feel at one with everything, and uh, the self is no longer a separate entity. I recognize that uh, truth takes many different forms of expression, but that in some way, all the traditions are pointing at a deep underlying reality. The deepest insights sound like cliches, you know, that the truth makes you free, and that God is love, and that love is at the heart of the universe. It was as though the, the doors of perception were not only cleansed, but they disappeared altogether, and uh, there was a noetic quality to it. Frances Vaughn wrote very eloquently about her mystical experience. As I've read that, um, you know, it meets all the criteria for a classic mystical experience. There's a sense of the interconnectedness of all things, a sense of sacredness or reverence, this noetic sense that is more real, more true than everyday waking consciousness. Uh, she also reported transcendence of time and space, heart opening, sense of gratitude, peace, love, and then this sense of the ineffability. The, these experiences are so difficult to put into words. But Francis did such an eloquent job of describing, you know, all of those features in, in her experience. Very touching. Francis went on to become a pioneer in the field of transpersonal psychology. Her book on intuition was a breakthrough at the time of publication. She traces the inspiration for her work back to that early experience with psychedelics. Having that experience certainly influenced my work in the world because becoming aware of the extent of human suffering makes one want to uh, do whatever we can to alleviate it. So that was in part what 
inspired me to go back to school and study psychology and then become a psychotherapist. It's as though once you have learned to see differently, you know that there's a possibility that the way we usually see the world is very constricted and it's only a, a fraction. It is as if we were looking through the chinks of a cavern or watching the shadows in Plato's cave. And uh, that experience was like turning around and not mistaking the shadows for reality, but really uh, seeing the light for the first time. Jim Fadiman was among the researchers who conducted the study that liberated Frances and clarified the direction of her work. What was wonderful about Frances's experience is that she had had actually just the right education and had the right vocabulary. One of the things we learned is that if you, you had this experience and then you had to put it back in your little box and if you didn't have any vocabulary, it was very difficult. And to the extent you had a vocabulary from philosophy, better from religious studies, better from mystical studies, um, and from kind of classical education, the more um, terms you had, the more kind of small boxes to put small parts in. And what was lovely in looking at Frances's is that she somehow had prepared herself, um, obviously inadvertently, perhaps, um, for this experience. And so the amount of life changing that went on was easier for Frances because she had this foundation where she had concepts that, that, that worked for her already. Her own Western culture is primarily dominated by its focus on the ordinary waking state and doesn't pay much attention to altered states. For example, that our culture is somewhat, un somewhat rare actually cross-culturally in not using psychedelics for healing and spiritual purposes. Actually, some 90% of the world's cultures have access to and use altered states of consciousness and often use psychedelics for that purpose, particularly for healing and for spiritual maturation, insight and understanding. One of the things that I think is very interesting for us as Westerners and in modern times to take a, a look at how the indigenous cultures have really worked with plant medicines because uh, they have worked with them from the beginning of time and has have seen them as medicine. So the classic hallucinogens are LSD, psilocybin, DMT, and mescaline. Uh, and then there are uh, synthetic compounds that are derivations of those. They have extraordinary impact uh, at extraordinarily low doses on the mind and they in induce a variety of very dramatic experiences, deep uh, emotional releases, deep archetypal imagery, and have the capacity to unveil aspects of mind which uh, most of the time are hidden and inaccessible to us. People have described psilocybin and LSD as if they're amplifiers, meaning the, the state you're in, you'll be more of it. Um, Huxley, I think, did a much better job, which said there's a reducing valve that we normally have in order to function. And it restricts our sensory awareness, it restricts our perception, it restricts our emotions, so we can function. It's, it's absolutely necessary for survival. Psychedelics tend to open the valve. Like Francis, Jim Fadiman also came into his work through a powerful mystical experience with psychedelics. At the time, he was a graduate student in psychology at Stanford and had taken a course with Willis Harmon, who was working quietly with the Menlo Park Research Group. Harmon invited Jim to participate in a study in which he was given 200 micrograms of LSD at the Institute offices. I then put on some eye shades, lay down on a couch, listen to music, this being the uh, method that they had developed uh, through the work of Al Hubbard and others, and um, basically had my little mind washed away, much to my surprise. And uh, the day went on in kind of classic psychedelic, high dose, uh, in theogenic fashion where I discovered that my disinterest in spiritual things um, 
was as valid as kind of a ten-year-old's disinterest in sex. It came out of a total unawareness of what the rest of the world was built on. And I went to a place where there was uh, the total uh, aloneness, the, the got to walk this valley by yourself, deep awareness of separation from the universe, and that there really was nothing that you could hold on to, which fortunately is very, very close to the place next to it where there is only one thing and you're part of it. But at that point, I simply experienced that I was more than Jim Fadiman. And that was the major revelation, that Jim Fadiman was a subset of me, and that Jim Fadiman was a perfectly nice guy, nothing, nothing bad about him in particular. Um, but his comprehension was limited to what kind of fit inside this bag, and that the comprehension that the psychedelic opened me to was simply considerably larger, had a very different time frame, had a different space frame, and was not any less true than this existence, um, and not necessarily more true, but simply uh, a larger vision. It's pretty much as if um, you've been kind of raised in a, in a coal mine all your life, and you come out and you're at the Super Bowl. I went around, in a sense, pretending to be Jim Fadiman for weeks while I sorted this out. And from that, I then joined the research team uh, at the International Foundation for Advanced Study. And I was their psychologist. And I said, I'm a first year graduate student and I've taken almost no psychology. They say, well, that's the way it goes. Um, you're our psychologist for now. What I was allowed and able to do, and I had to work this out with Stanford, is I showed up once or twice a week and would sit through the eight hours or nine hours of someone's session, and I was had been introduced to them, and so I was there to be another helper. Uh, and I basically stood back most of the time, except when they interacted with me personally. So I was seeing people coming in, lying down, having music and, and eye shades, and then sitting up dazzled with the beauty and joy of the universe. One of the reasons um, that the mystical experience is important in the modern culture is that it's a deep remembrance of our humanity, which is uh, very different than anything that is uh, technical or objectified. Uh, it's the one place that uh, aligns the four universal intelligences, uh, the mind, the heart, the intuitive or the gut and the body wisdom come deeply uh, aligned uh, in that process. I'm not one of the people who discovered. I'm one of the people who came along and hung out with the discoverers and discovered with them some new things. So I'm what I call third wave. First wave was Hoffman, who really didn't know what was going to happen, and the first few people he gave it to, like Sandgroff, who had no idea what was going on. Um, by the time you got to the second wave, people like Huxley and Leary, they already knew this was something very special. They didn't know quite what it was, but it was very special. By the time it came to, to my generation, it was, we kind of know the way it's special, and we've, we've found ways to make it better or not as good. And so I've been, I've been really at the, at the foot of these earlier giants who were much more true explorers. I'm more someone who, after the exploration is done, I say, well, maybe we could make a village over here and plant crops over here because you've shown me um, what this region holds. Well, the earliest researchers were a wide-ranging group of people, some of the brightest and most inquisitive minds of the time. People like Aldous Huxley, an intellectual giant, Houston Smith, one of the great religious scholars of the 20th century, uh, Richard Alpert, and uh, the notorious uh, Tim Leary of Harvard fame, and a variety of psychiatrists and psychologists, 
all of whom began to intuit that these substances had remarkable potential in their own, for their own understanding of, of human beings and uh, for our human potential and who were moved to investigate them at a time when they were little known and little understood. Albert Hoffman is best known for his discovery of LSD, but actually was one of the great pharmacologists of the 20th century. And he discovered and synthesized thousands, actually tens and tens of thousands of substances. And in 1938, he was working on a series of uh, ergot alkaloids. And uh, as they usually test these substances, that when they come up with a new substance, they test them on animals. The, Animal report came back uh, with not much interesting, animals mildly agitated, and so he uh, went on and that was long forgotten. But then in 1943, he had this very curious feeling. What he said was, I just had this curious feeling about this chemical, and, and so I resynthesized it, and, and a couple of hours later, I had this very curious experience, and I figured I must have gotten contaminated by it some, in some way. But I couldn't understand how that was possible because I, I could only have ingested a tiny, minuscule amount. So I uh, synthesized another batch three days later, and three days later deliberately took a, an extremely small dose of 250 micrograms, which actually, as we know now, is a massive dose of psychedelics. And after that, he, uh, of course, found himself having the world's first trip, psychedelic trip. Uh, was totally overwhelmed by it. This was in wartime Basel. There were no cars or taxis available. So he got on his bicycle and started riding uh, back to his home. And uh, by the time he got there, he was feeling very unusual. They called his doctor and the doctor took a look at him and said, well, you know, blood pressure's a little raised, pupils are dilated, but yeah, you're fine. So they left him alone. <laughs> And uh, he had this initially very painful and terrifying experience, but then, it, then at the peak of the psychedelic experience, it turned into this wonderful peak experience. Now, the interesting thing is that Hoffman had synthesized tens of thousands of compounds. And he said that in my entire professional life, there was only one substance I synthesized that failed animal testing that I resynthesized, and that was LSD. I just felt somehow that it called to me. Houston Smith made a major contribution to our understanding of psychedelics, primarily in his role as a religious scholar. Initially, most religious scholars, theologians, and others dismissed the spiritual significance of these substances, saying that the apparent mystical experiences that they induced were actually pseudo-mystical experiences. They weren't real spiritual experiences. But Houston Smith argued very cogently that yes, these substances could induce real spiritual experiences with valid and valuable effects on people. He said when he after he took psilocybin the first time. Now I understand, actually, for the first time, these religions that uh, I've already written about and become the expert on. Stand, standing from the inside, you know, so that, that is, a, is a tremendous gift. He wrote a paper that's been republished many, many times in which he said that the mystical experience that could be induced by psychedelics was phenomenologically indistinguishable from natural mystical experiences. There was a kind of a breakthrough in the 60s that happened, of which the drugs you know, were one aspect of it. And the, uh, and the fact that you could reliably, in a significant number of people, induce an altered state uh, you know, through these drugs, that, and actually an expanded state. Ralph Metzner first participated in psychedelic research as a graduate student at Harvard University in the early 1960s with professors Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert, who was later named Ramdas. 
and a lot of my work has been around normalizing this notion of expanding and contracting consciousness, having it be something that's under your voluntary intention, and then using the expanded states that we find ourselves in for our own chosen purposes. <laughs> Stan Groff is clearly one of the greatest contributors to our understanding of psychedelics and in several ways. First, he conducted more experiments than anyone else uh, conducting, personally conducting trials with over a thousand subjects. And so he built up a vast clinical repertoire of uh, people's experiences of one kind or another. But the other major contribution he made was to create a new understanding of the human psyche in which he synthesized the reports from thousands of people around the world and managed to create a new map of the human mind pointing to its many layers and the fact that psychedelics were unique in being able to unveil depths of the psyche which usually are not available to us except through very deep psychotherapy, or more commonly through very deep contemplative practices. Stan Groff came out of um, Eastern Europe, Czechoslovakia. He came out of a strong psychoanalytic tradition which says that your childhood is, is pivotal in your adult life. And he came out of working with extremely disturbed people in mental hospitals with a method of low dose and many, many sessions. So he would give people 30, 40, 50 sessions uh, and they would gradually go through what appeared to him a developmental sequence, again ending up with these mystical experiences and enormously improved mental health. When he came to us, we said, we actually just go right to the end. And what we found is that if you start by giving a person this mystical experience, then when you ask them to look at their psychodynamics, it's from an enlightened point of view. It's from a compassionate point of view. It's, oh, oh, wow. You, this personal human being of which is a subset of me, um, I, and I see your problems totally um, as solvable because they're minor. One of the odd parts of my career is that my initial work was with, with Ram Dass and then later friendly with the Harvard group. Uh, I did my training with the Menlo Park group, and I was also peripheral but involved with the Ken Kesey group as well. So we were explorers. We were a little bit like the people who would leave Spain or Portugal, and if you, no matter how badly you sailed, somewhere between Newfoundland and Tierra del Fuego, you hit something that nobody had been to. And so anything you did counted. And so in those early days, everything we did counted. And so each of these groups was really exploring different parts of the continent. Uh, sometimes they cooperated. I was actually for a while the liaison between the Harvard group and the Menlo Park group because we all wanted the government uh, not only not to bother us, but to support us. Um, that liaison didn't work out. Uh, Tim Leary said it beautifully. He, we said, Tim, you're going too far out. You're gonna hurt us all. And Tim said, it's true, I am much farther out than you. I think it should be much more widely available. I'm not at all an elitist. And if I win, we all win. And if I lose, then you people doing kind of the more science stuff, you'll still be there. And he was wrong. Sometime in 1965, um, Willis, who was a professor at Stanford, came up with the notion that perhaps these psychedelics in our explorations could be used to focus the part of the mind that's interested in hard-nosed scientific problem solving. Not beauty, not mysticism, not psychedelic um, exploration, not psychotherapy, just science. So we developed a, a protocol, a kind of scientific model that said, we think that scientists, given a much smaller dose than we would give for mystical experience, who care deeply about their problems, can use these to solve problems. And so we literally established a study. 
We had groups of four. The scientists, in order to get into the study, had to have uh, a problem that they cared deeply about, that they had spent several months on, and had not had great success. And we told them that this would work. We, we totally pretended that we knew what we were doing. And the first group, it worked. Most people felt they'd made a huge step forward and had a new way of looking at the problem. A number had solutions. A number went to have products made and so forth. So it was all terrific. And we're running our seventh or eighth group, and we get a letter from the Food and Drug Administration, and it says, hello, as of the receipt of this letter, your research exemption is canceled. It was, it was quite a moment. And this truly never occurred to us because we couldn't have been nicer people. And our subjects were wonderful people. We were not doing any harm. But the government was a little hysterical about people out in the streets and not liking the war and all kinds of things that bothered the government. And so for reasons known only to them, they shut off all research. All research in the US in one day, about 60 projects. It's fascinating to think about historically from the standpoint of how science develops. I mean, just if, if you just think about it, what does it mean that a whole area of research is not investigated for 30 years? Why exactly the early research was halted is an intriguing question. At one level, there's a superficial answer. Well, some people had bad experiences and people and authorities wor worried about that and so stopped the research. But that's only part of the question uh, and part of the answer. Actually, the, the psychedelics had both extremely positive and sometimes very damaging effects. But there was a, a superficial media sensationalism which emphasized the tragic effects and gave almost no attention to the clinical uses and the experimental potentials and the therapeutic power of these substances. So the culture as a whole got a very lopsided view of psychedelics and their possibilities. Then there was a very interesting uh, political and cultural dimension to it, in as much as many of the people who took psychedelics initially had significant shifts in their values. And in some ways, many of these shifts ran counter to the conventional cultural values of materialism, of capitalism, and seriously called these uh, values into question. So that was in some ways threatening. So the legitimate research shut down, we experienced this cultural trauma, and I think we're just recovering from that. So it's only recently that our laboratory and other laboratories have been able to seek and get approval to reinitiate this research. And it's very exciting. One of the reasons it's turning around at this point is that the generation that passed all these repressive laws and passed all this amazing send people to jail for working on their own minds um, are passing away, are passing out of power. And the people who are coming into power, the new legislators, the new regulators, the new judges, the new lawyers, the new police, most of them are part of at least that 23 million people who've experienced psychedelics. And they know that it may not be beneficial, but they sure know it doesn't harm you or kill you. So they are no longer arbitrarily preventing medicine and science and psychology and spiritual organizations from exploring these materials because they personally are no longer frightened. If you look closely at how substances are controlled by the government, the decisions about how restricted they are are based on political considerations and not grounded in science. So you have a combination of factors that are still demonizing these substances. I'm kind of surprised that things like psychedelics are so potentially important and powerful that there are only just a half a dozen people studying them. It's, that's kind of amazing. 
David Nichols has worked at Purdue University since 1974, researching the medicinal chemistry and pharmacology of psychedelics. You have to really re-educate people to understand that a lot of the hype that they heard from the media was just, it was hype, it was blown up out of proportion. And that, um, that these things can have value, but we have to discover what they are. Most of us in the field are very quick to say they aren't for everyone. But as one of the participants in our study uh, said in, in a letter to Dr. Grobe, for the people they can help, they are a godsend. Alicia Danforth has conducted research with Dr. Charles Grobe, working with cancer patients, using psychedelics to improve their experience as they dealt with the difficulties of their illness or approached the end of their lives. Like many people, she originally thought psychedelic drugs were dangerous. I was working as a software development project manager when I read a book that included accounts from individuals with mental illness who had been helped um, as a result of taking ecstasy, MDMA. And I was actually moved to tears. It was so powerful. I couldn't understand why these medicines weren't available to people who were suffering and didn't have other good means of treatment available to them. Sometimes when we're in a challenging situation in life, our thoughts can get stuck in a loop. Negative thoughts just continue and continue and continue. And psilocybin can, in a therapeutic setting, can function like a big hand coming in and jiggling the needle on a skipping record so that a new tune can resume. The magic pill doesn't transform the individual. It simply allows what's already there to come forward and be examined in a new way. Well, it's interesting. Uh, we can't really attribute uh, a mystical experience to a drug or a ma magic pill or to the peyote button. We were ready at some time when that happened, the synchronicity that something latent was ready to be opened, to be uncovered, discovered, and recovered, or something to be looked at that couldn't have been looked at in any other way. Uh, and the timing, the circumstances, the people, the what's called the set and setting, uh, allowed or contributed or was a confluence to something, uh, to a readiness. Set being the internal the intention that you bring to it, and the setting being the setting they create. Of what all those two actually set is more primary, because the set also then determines what kind of a setting you you set up, you choose. And when you think about it, that's actually true of everything. Right? It's all all of our experience. Like right, the experience we're having right now is a function of the set and setting uh, that we bring to it. When we were enrolling participants for the study, we had to be exceptionally careful not to give them the impression that we were treating the cancer. One of our participants was a woman in her middle 50s. She was a mother, and she had led a fairly conservative life. She had attended church on and off, and she had never tried a psychedelic in her life. And she sought help by enrolling in this study because she was having repetitive negative thoughts. And she wanted to see if she could be a bit more free in her thinking and not be so consumed with worry. And she didn't know how long she had to live, but something told her that maybe psilocybin could help stop this pattern that she was in of negative thinking. I admired her because she was so brave she didn't know what was going to happen when she took psilocybin, but she arrived with a very open attitude. And about four hours in to the active session, the session with the, the psilocybin, she started to move her body in a way that was uh, very riveting for those of us in the room. It felt as if we were seeing something very unique and powerful. 
And she went into this deep inner process that involved moving her hands in repetitive ways. And it looked as if she was working very hard, but we didn't interrupt her. We didn't know what was going on. Um, eventually, the time came when we needed to take a blood pressure because we were looking at safety. And I just gently put a hand on her shoulder. And then she reached up to take off her eye shades and I asked her, you know, how are you doing? And she looked up at me with little tears in her eyes and she said, it feels like healing. Interestingly, she uh, outlived her original prognosis by a significant amount and she found that the healing she received during the psilocybin session was helpful in uh, improving the quality of the time that she had remaining. I actually came into this research with a bit of skepticism, although some of my colleagues with whom I'm, I'm working on the project didn't have much skepticism, but I, I was in no means, by no means a true believer as we set out on this research. Roland Griffiths is a psychopharmacologist at Johns Hopkins University who researches mystical experiences induced by psychedelics. We have one study now running in cancer patients. Again, these are, these are patients who are anxious or depressed secondary to their cancer diagnosis. It's an existential anxiety, in effect. And, um, and the inspiration for the study comes from work done by Stan Groff and others back in the 1950s and 60s, as well as very recently, Charlie Grobe and Alicia Danforth, uh, who did a pilot study at UCLA showing beneficial effects of psilocybin in uh, cancer patients. We're using higher doses and a, and a different kind of design uh, to look at that. And um, our results are blinded, but they're very much in line with Charlie Grobe's results. Drawing on the work of earlier researchers, the Johns Hopkins team has written guidelines for safe research. So set and setting is, is absolutely key to the nature of the experiences that can unfold with psilocybin. In our case, all our volunteers are very carefully screened. Uh, they're prepared with a minimum of eight contact hours with their guides, who are skilled clinicians, prior to their first session. They're in the presence of two guides throughout their session, and then aftercare is provided. These are very special and contextualized conditions under which psilocybin is administered. So very often there's a centeredness that people come out with after an experience of this sort that, um, uh, that lets them be more accepting of the fact that they may be dying. It's uh, very touching to see people interact with their own family members and they'll say, you know, I'm, I'm very sad that I'm dying. I'm, I'm gonna miss you. But, you know, there's in another sense, it's okay. And, uh, and everything's okay. And, and, and when you hear someone put that into words for their own family members, their own caretakers, they're beginning to take care of their own caretakers, it's very moving. In the Western psychotherapy, we've assumed that people have to work on their experiences to change them. It has to be an effortful working with. But what the psychedelic uh, research has discovered and in this they echoed the findings of contemplative practitioners, is that simply by bringing awareness to experiences, those experiences can unfold and release and heal and develop into positive capacities and potentials. So this was a radical re-understanding or reinterpretation of how the psyche grows and heals. Government does a survey every year of a large number of people and asks them about all kinds of things, including all kinds of drug use. And one of the things they've come up with is over the years, the number of people 
who've been using psychedelics is now somewhere in the 23 million range for U.S. citizens only. And that number goes up four to 600,000 a year. I've now done a bunch of surveys and I say to people, have you ever had a bad trip? And almost everyone says yes. And then they, I say, how many of you felt in the long run it was a very beneficial event? And most of them say it was. We know from the 1960s, you know, that what, millions of kids uh, took these compounds? A number of them had significant experiences, a number of them had terrible experiences, but, but they, not all of those people then went off to, uh, to pursue the implications of those experiences. One of the reasons our culture ran into such trouble with psychedelics was because we really had no history with them. We had no understanding of their potentials, their impact, their power. So you approach them honorably and respectfully. You never approach them uh, uh, disrespectfully or, or for avoidance uh, and for, quote, getting high uh, or recreationally, is that you approach them reverentially and respectfully because you know that they have something to teach you, something to uh, learn from and with, them, something to open to, to resolve, and to basically remember our inherent goodness and our inherent largesse. I care a lot about the benefits, but I care even more that people who shouldn't use them don't. And there's two levels of that. One, in the literature, if you've had any kind of severe mental illness, you're probably not a good candidate. Um, and if you currently have a mental illness, you're not a good candidate. If you're very frightened, you're not a good candidate. If you are a distrustful type, which means you could go into paranoia, you're not a good candidate. One of the questions that's repeatedly raised about psychedelics is whether the experiences they induce have long-lasting beneficial effects. It's clear that people can think they're beneficial initially, but do they really have long-lasting benefits? And it seems they certainly can. We've run uh, several different studies. We've run two studies now in healthy, normal volunteers who have no history of prior uh, exposure to classic hallucinogens. And um, the first study was done uh, to compare a fairly high dose of psilocybin with a dose of a comparator compound. We chose Ritalin or methylphenidate as a comparator, but we, we ran the study under ways that deeply blinded the conditions to both volunteers and to the guides that were present in the study. And we compared the two and showed that psilocybin occasioned experiences that look very much like the classic mystical type experience. There, there have been virtually no studies that show an, some kind of acute manipulation or acute occasioning reaction changes personality. Psilocybin does. Those people who have mystical type experiences end up showing uh, increases in the personality domain of openness. So what's openness? It's interesting because openness is very, very closely allied to creativity, tolerance of views of other people, uh, intellectual flexibility. Rowling showed that these people had these transcendental experiences and now has followed up and shown that there's this positive personality uh, improvement that's lasted for well over a year. The nature of this uh, mystical experience is that now we've shown that it can occur in most people studied. And so the primary implication of that is that it's biologically normal. We're wired to have these kinds of experiences really depends on how the person uses the experience, whether they open to it, whether they explore the implications, whether they take up practices which will maintain the open-mindedness and depth of understanding that the uh, chemicals induced in the first place. Houston Smith put it beautifully. He said that it's clear that psychedelics can induce religious experiences. It's less clear that they induce religious lives. But I'd add to that that it's also clear they can induce religious lives. And Francis is an example of that. 
Uh, Jack Kornfield, major Buddhist teacher in the United States, has said that in, in his experience, that 80% of the Buddhist teachers in the United States either got a beginning by using psychedelics or had psychedelics early in their practice, which deepened their interest in their practice. And so what we have is spiritual practices which lead to altered states of consciousness. We have plants and mushrooms and synthetics which lead to altered states of consciousness. And we have spontaneous altered states of consciousness. It looks like altered states of consciousness is one of the things that we're given access to by being human. And the cultures that have discovered various ways of doing it, almost without exception, have made that an important part of their culture. Some years ago, I interviewed a number of spiritual teachers who had themselves used psychedelics, and there was a remarkable consistency to their thinking about this. All of them agreed that psychedelics could be valuable as part of the spiritual practice. But all of them, every single one, emphasized that psychedelics by themselves were a problematic spiritual practice. That is, they felt that they were too powerful and too unpredictable to be recommended as a primary spiritual practice. However, when integrated with a spiritual practice, all of them agreed they had uh, remarkable potential. And all of them agreed that the, the key was a judicious use with spiritual practice before and after the use of the psychedelics. We, uh, we've gotten involved in this intersection between meditation and psilocybin. And so we're doing a, what I think of as a very interesting study right now in which we're recruiting in healthy volunteers who neither have an established meditation practice and they have limited use of classic hallucinogens. And, and, uh, and we're encouraging them to take up a meditation practice. We ask them to do meditation daily for six months. And over the course of that six months, they have two or three psilocybin sessions. And so we're very interested in this intersection between the mindfulness that's cultivated by sitting meditation practice and the exploration of mind, very different that occurs with high-dose psilocybin. There's no single thing you can do to produce mystical experiences. Uh, meditation or fasting can increase the probability of those experiences, but not in a high enough percentage of people to actually study it prospectively. So most of what we know about these experiences have been retrospective reports. What the work with psilocybin opens up is that the finding is that, that most people exposed under these conditions have this kind of experience. And what that means now is that we can do prospective scientific studies of that phenomena for the first time. And so it really opens up our ability to explore scientifically and rigorously the nature of those experiences. This research has the potential to uh, open us to new understandings about the mind, about spirituality, about religion, about human potentials and capacities. And if you can treat anxiety and depression in people that are dying, uh, why do they have to be dying? If people have chronic anxiety about something or depression, it may be that we'll find treatments so that people don't have to be on antidepressants for years and years and years. Maybe there will be a single or two or three treatments that we can give with a psychedelic that will take care of that. We asked 100 people, how important is this event in your life? And 78% of them said, this is the single most important experience of my entire life. It's a quantum change that occurs all or none. And this now is a model system for investigating how the human organism is capable of this radical change in perception and behavior going forward. And if we've done anything, we have raised the bar for what we think not the best people are capable of, but what most people are capable of. 
And one of the nice things about working with psychedelics is they're very democratic. They, um, they don't distinguish necessarily uh, one person from another at the transcendent level. See, if you're connected to everything, then who are you not connected to? And that's, if you get that as a basic position in life, then you are much less likely to turn anyone into other. Because in the transcendent world, there, there is no other. It really does uh, release the barriers to love and release the barriers to actualizing potential. So I hope that uh, the research can continue for the benefit of all beings. Thank you.